and I'm from the School of Communication at Simon Fraser University. And it is my very great honor tonight to introduce you to Dr. Patricia Ofterheide, who is able to join us from American University. Patricia is a, a rather interesting character and actually leader in the study of public policy for public media. I've been following her career since 1996 and her extremely important book, which was released for uh, Canadian scholars and really did um, decode, if you like, the American um, policy system and the incredible revisions of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Her book, uh, Communications and the Public Interest, at that time, represented an approach to scholarship that was quite unique and I think a tremendous um, exemplar for all Canadians working in the field. She um, presented a unique book. It was really a half monograph and a half an, an activist primer gathering together all of the key policy documents that people had to acquaint themselves with reviewing the core decisions, the speeches and the interviews, and providing fantastic catalysts for discussions for all people who were interested in the rather amazing changes underway in the United States. Uh, at that time, Dr. Ofterheide was prescient in our view in Canada. She predicted that the act would prove a very weak instrument at resolving conflicts arising from intensification of competition in communications in the United States, and certainly she has proven to be true 10 years later. She also correctly identified how the burden of proof shifted to public interest advocates to promote civic debate about political issues, about educating uh, citizens how to seize control of their communications landscape. And uh, she was absolutely forthright in her assessment that that 96 Act impoverished um, public sites and non-commercial areas of communications binding citizens uh, of any kind. I have the feeling tonight she's going to give a different talk, a talk that will be, I think, fundamentally more optimistic than the 96 version. I don't want to misrepresent Pat's career because she has published extensively and in her role as director of the Center for Social Media, uh, and there are some marvelous brochures describing their work for you, she has been active publishing subsequently uh, books on the Daily Planet, but probably extremely useful guides to independent documentary filmmakers in the United States about how to mobilize more freely um, in the use of um, other materials in their creative representations to really create new practices of fair use in intellectual property law. So uh, we are delighted to have Patricia here tonight and she will be talking about vlogs, iPods and beyond. But what is I think important is to remember the purpose tonight for us to be together and it is really actually in commemoration of the passing of Graham Spry. And we are deeply indebted to the support of Lib Spry and the remaining Spry family members, who together with the University of Montreal, and I believe one of the founders, uh, Dr. Brian Lewis, who is now Dean of the Faculty of Applied Science. I did see Dr. Lewis arrive. Where is he? We have to thank you, Brian, indeed, for working with Mark Raboy and a number of others to establish this series 11 years ago. The series uh, is supported and available on the website. You need to only uh, Google the term Graham Spry Foundation and you'll find a tremendous um, archive of 11 papers represented by leading in public intellectuals of their day. Uh, I also want to suggest that Graham would be very pleased to see Pat here today because as a, uh, a, an activist and a lobbyist and a scholar of no small repute on his own, he was very much a political pragmatist and very much an activist. As you may know, Graham Spry, together with his partner, Alan Plant, succeeded at a time of dark depression, at a time of widespread public fear, 
in rallying around a vision of hope a vision of a public broadcaster in this country who would integrate Canadians and indeed challenge them intellectually to new cultural uh, um, creations. His uh, commitment to the concept of public broadcasting in his day was actually beyond compare. Uh, he was a sloganeer of great repute and gave us the rallying cry that proved a basis for a paper that he published in 1931 called The Case for Nationalized Broadcasting. And at that time, he characterized the fight for a public, state-supported broadcaster in a time of Great Depression. He fought for it before the then Prime Minister R.B. Bennett with a slogan that has gone down over the ages called The State or the United States. And of course, it's been framed in a kind of discourse and, and, and myth about our Canadian history of nationalism that has become quite famous and is found in all of our encyclopedias, many of our textbooks, and uh, many of the early histories of the CBC that many have, have, have supported. But I think you will find today that Patricia's non-traditional interpretation of his work will take us beyond mere nationalist frames for social activism in democratic communication. Because Graham Spry himself was very much an internationalist, very much active in South Asia, active in the UK, active in what was in the 30s, an emerging cosmopolitanism associated then with a social democratic, social justice agenda in the League for Social Reconstruction that was very important. So Graham Spry today would be extremely encouraged, I think, by the kinds of ideas that Patricia will be sharing with us. He would be encouraged because they speak to something which is very simple, and that is communications can never be controlled, corralled, disciplined, solely in the name of the state or solely in the name of the market. Communications in polities are the lifeblood of its peoples, and I think that is at heart the kind of source of revolution in democratic communication that this series is trying to plant the seeds for. So I'm truly honored to introduce you tonight, Dr. Patricia Ofterheide, and I would like to say that we will share her talk and her ideas then move to a very provocative, informal kind of question period, and then finally move to um, uh, uh, a reception for us all so we can carry on the discussions or the argu arguments outside. And just before I conclude, I would like to thank particularly um, the people who have been able to make this event possible. I would like to thank the Office of the President at Simon Fraser University, who has been a strong supporter, Michael Stevenson, of this series over the years. I once again would like to thank the Dean of the Faculty of Applied Sciences, Brian Lewis. I'd like to thank the Director of our School of Communications, Martin Lava, and all the people, Brenda Baldwin, uh, Sue Jamison McLaren, Sarah Birchall, who will be filming this for our website for perpetuity, and we're welcoming, look, um, sorry, Working TV tonight also, who will be broadcasting this uh, by web. Uh, in addition, we've had some volunteers tonight step forward, very important ones, and Neil Noreen, Sarah Grimes, thank you for making this all orderly. And now to be disorderly, Patricia, thank you very much. My speech in particular follows, if any of you were here, on the remarks of Graham Murdoch two years ago. Uh, he talked to you two years ago about the emergence of a digital commons. That's Graham Spry. Um, I'd like tonight to propose that public media are in fact blooming and evolving, if not necessarily within public broadcasting. It's true that public broadcasting is facing very big challenges. Mark Raboy reminded us last year that neoliberal economists and the politicians who love them have restructured the entire discourse around public broadcasting. They ask, 
why taxpayers who have a myriad options in their media marketplace need to pay taxes for a service like this. If you put it another way, if we don't have a government-run organic produce stand next to our supermarkets, why do we need public broadcasters on our televisions, radios, and internet? And of course, that question just got more complicated with new media technologies. And if Rupert Murdoch buys MySpace and considers dumping his uh, satellite assets because he's looking forward to wireless digital distribution, where does that leave any broadcaster? If bloggers are so busy linking to each other that they hardly have time to watch television, are newsreaders irrelevant? TiVo, iPods, vlogs, broadband internet video, they're changing what we think television is. So who cares? Who cares about the future of public broadcasting? Well, I would argue that the state cares. The state has, in the past, had a very strong interest in having its own broadcaster. And in the Commonwealth countries, John Reef had a vision at the BBC that was very compelling. And it conveniently conflated the public good uh, with the government's good by asserting the need for a mass media channel that would promote social unity and stability. Also, in many places outside the US and outside Canada, public broadcasting serves as a bulwark, and, and in Canada, including in Canada, public broadcasting serves as a bulwark of cultural nationalism, especially against Hollywood. That's why the US doesn't have it, because we have Hollywood. Um, and this is, of course, cultural nationalism was of real and longstanding interest to governments. Let's take a moment to remember that Graham Spry set out on his saga to promote public broadcasting by organizing an unprecedented nationwide broadcast to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Canadian Federation. And as we heard Catherine say so well, the creation of a national broadcasting service for him was a choice between the state and the United States. I must say that I think your public broadcasters have played, however, a somewhat of an ambiguous role in this. I understand, although it's possibly apocryphal, you could tell me that the CBC ran a competition in the 1970s for the conclusion to the sentence, as Canadian as, and gave the award to the winning answer, as Canadian as possible under the circumstances. <laughs> I think that's true. I found it on Wikipedia. Um, OK, public broadcasting has served state interests adequately enough to create substantial support for these services over the years. Uh, the fact that Graham Spry was a very sturdy socialist did not deter a conservative government from establishing what became the CBC. Who else cares? Well, broadcasters themselves care because they, they know they're doing a good job and they want to keep doing it. And the struggle for survival of broadcasters themselves, because they like being broadcasters, is, is very boldly display, on display in the United States. Uh, and that's possibly because we lack majority state support for our public broadcasters. We have a so-called system uh, that is an, actually an improbable sprawl of individual stations and a host of aggregators and service providers. Uh, in fact, when pub US public broadcasting was created in 1970 out of a real patchwork of educational broadcasters, legislators created a very loose federation of private nonprofit broadcast stations beaming a fairly local, local signal at localities and then subsidized it with a real trickle of federal funds and it's grown to 18 percent, but only 18 percent of the total budget. And that was to be matched with uh, money from state and local taxpayers, listeners, viewers, corporate givers, foundations, and the endless, endless hawking of t-shirts and mugs. Each little unit is now desperate to figure out how to survive in our system. Ironically, in the U.S., multipartisan and particularly Republican support for taxpayer funding is what has saved uh, public broadcasting from its neoliberal foes again and again. Public broadcasters are widely seen as offering uncontroversial and high-quality programming contrasting to our rather trashy uh, commercial uh, broadcasting environment. These public broadcasting institutions, which rest upon, all the dif different institutions rest upon two brand, national brand names, which are PBS and NPR. Um, they, get, they get the highest trust ratings of any media in the United States. But these institutions really struggle to raise their profiles from the pleasant, the genteel, and the decent to essential and even edgy in the eyes of consumers on whom their future now depends. 
At the same time, they need their rather bland reputation for uncontroversial quality to maintain the broad support that they've already won. So it's, it's quite a balancing act on any good day, and frankly, these are not good days for broadcasters of any kind. Well, it's never easy, been easy to be a public broadcaster, although it was easier in the old days, and, and that's when the lunches were legendary. It is, it is getting harder by the minute, and that's hard for them. Fortunately for me, I am not a public broadcaster. Uh, there's every possibility that you are also not a public broadcaster. So why do we care? Well, because communications make up the circulatory system of public life in a democracy, as you heard from Catherine Murray. For almost a century, mass media have been central to what we call the public sphere. Now here I'm borrowing a term from the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas, who I'm sure you're familiar with, and furthermore, borrowing some thinking from a great American philosopher and educator, John Dewey. And then I'm weaving in some concerns of political scientists who care about strong democracy, such as Benjamin Barber. And I'm not going to take up your time parsing the different arguments that all of these thinkers make separately. What I would like to do in order to create a justification for the remarks I will then make is to give you a highly synthetic set of conclusions that I think are widely shared among the group of us who would even consider attending a lecture with the title Public Broadcasting in it. A democratic civil society is one in which individual citizens have a way they can both find out what's affecting the nature and quality of their public lives together and can also act together to do something about it. So the public sphere, this is a term we borrow from Jürgen Habermas, is uh, an informal zone of such activity. And it's concerned specifically with public life. That is to say, the part of our lives that we, in which we manage the quality of our shared culture. So church, the water cooler, post office, sidewalks, Starbucks, they're all places in, in the physical world where, this is what your Digerati friends are calling meat space, uh, where people do this kind of communication and in this space where they, that's the space into which they bring all of their experience with media. So it's, the public is not a, a an entity that you can go find. It's a part of your life. It's an unstructured set of social relationships. And that's where you can mobilize power on the basis of your concern about a particular problem with the people who also face that problem against organized interests. And those organized interests might be the state and they might be large corporations. So for almost a century, mass media have been absolutely central to our communicative systems. They have acted for us like a pseudo public sphere. So public broadcasting services, they were not just discretionary sources of information. They were stand-ins for the top priority concerns of our shared public life. And the cultural expressions of, public, of broadcasting were similarly pseudo public culture. They were distilled examples of how a society understands itself. Public broadcasting has been a protected if somewhat compromised, but a protected zone that provides some opportunities for people to learn about each other and their problems and to share a common cultural experience of consuming the same media that is concerned about public issues. But public broadcasting hasn't and never can go beyond its pseudo public sphere status because it's a mass medium. The broadcasters at any one point speak to the many who then talk to each other in around their water cooler or at Starbucks. So the public broadcasters are stuck. They have, to, they have to stand in the place of the public. They have to act on their behalf, and then they have to hope they guessed right. Well, could new technologies bring media that was actually made by the public, for the public, and with the public? Well, we certainly now have technologies that have, for, for the first time in human history, created opportunities to make entirely new kinds of media. And people are leaping on it. The distinction is between one to many and many to many, and I'm sure you're familiar with this graphic as well. Digitalization and the internet have enabled that many to many communication, and even the primitive first iterations of the communities being shaped by this communication are extraordinary. And the pace of the change is also extraordinary. 
The blogosphere is doubling every six months, as measured in weblogs. It's growing into a multicultural and multilingual environment. Social networking has exploded. As you can see in this recent graph, traffic, that's the, on MySpace. MySpace is the blue line. Traffic on MySpace, which two years ago was insignificant, by last February had outstripped traffic to traditional news platforms such as the New York Times and CNN, and it is now comprising one, 50, some 15% of all internet traffic. So what's happened? What's happened is that what we used to call the audience is gradually being supplanted by a new entity, a wildly fluctuating set of networks of people engaged in issues and topics and passions. Some of those people are clusters of different publics. They seize upon communications media to make their networks real and make things happen. So yesterday, your screen talked to you. Today, you talk through it, whether you're talking on Skype or on your video-enabled cell phone. Yesterday, you listened to the news. Now you link to it on your blog. Yesterday, you watched the movie. Now you make a movie. Put it on YouTube and link it to your Facebook account. So is this new trend, is it, is it real yet, or are we still in sort of the early adopter phase? Well, the market has spoken here. Rupert Murdoch spent $580 million to buy MySpace and got the money back almost immediately. Google spent $1.65 billion to buy YouTube. YouTube had never made a dime at the moment. And NBC, a few weeks ago, declared, publicly declared itself an internet company and slashed its investment in analog TV and is, and is, is going to eliminate MSNBC, the cable channel. They're doing that in order to put the money into digital. Okay, so that's real, but don't tell me MySpace is public media. Will this new open environment actually generate public media? That is to say, I, I, I will provide my definition of public media, you might have another. Media, I would say, that is designed for public knowledge and action. Media that helps bring a public into being, that nourishes it. Well, now I would like to borrow some enthusiasm here. There's a new book called The Wealth of Nations, written by a brilliant legal scholar named Yochai Benkler. And he, in it, he makes a powerful argument. It just came out this summer. He makes a powerful argument that do-it-yourself media, combined with social networking, offer unprecedented opportunities for truly public communication. Communications can now truly, in the way that Habermas spoke about it, that Dewey imagined, can visibly be the constitutor of public life. When Dewey talked about it, he said it was impossible to get away from face-to-face -face communication because you had communication was the actual constitution of the public. That was how people became the public and, and acted as the public was actually by communicating with each other. We now have a way to imagine doing face-to-face -face communication in, um, in, virtual, in virtual space. So this is not... This is not just an idea. Now, this is actually practice. And I want to give you a couple of examples of media for public knowledge and action that is functioning in this fast-changing, um, morphing world. Now, as you know, everybody now has a blog. Who here has a blog? Yeah, I guess, you know, the rest of you don't need to start one. Because now there are at least 70 million. And they're growing by the minute and they're growing around the world. Now, it, it turns out that blogs are socializing machines. Writers want readers, and they get them by linking up to other bloggers and writing on other blogs about their blogs and hoping that people read, who read one blog will then read another. So what happens is that blogs form complex clouds of social relationships. Uh, and that people get to make visual representations of them using different kinds of visual technologies. Now, this is a visual representation by Lada Adamic and Natalie Glantz of the um, blogosphere around the 2004 election. This is a way of measuring who's linking to whom on their different blogs. Now, 
there are two big blobs there that are not really surprising. They're the Democratic blogs and the Republican blogs, the blue and the red. What is more surprising is that junk in the middle, the little pink stuff and the yellow stuff. That's the Democrats who are linking to the Republicans and the Republicans who are linking to the Democrats. But the real purpose of showing you this map is to show that you can map social relationships that are then created in blogs. Blogs are, are actually not just people speaking to anybody out in the world. They are actually speaking to people who they probably know and who know other people and who actually have relationships to them. Okay, so those are relationships, but who would call them a public relationship? In what sense do we mean that these are public? Are they actually fueling conversations about issues that affect the public in ways that allow a public to form and act. Well, consider a traditional role of public media, which would be to serve as a watchdog on power. That's why you have your investigative journalists, your nightly news, your uh, um, uh, news magazines. So the blogosphere actually does act as a watchdog on power that sometimes transcends political partisanship. I have to stop at this moment and apologize for the examples in this speech, which are really almost all drawn from the United States. It's where I live and it's what I know. I would actually love it if in our conversation after this talk, you're able to uh, uh, challenge or complement these with Canadian stories. So an example from the US. Recently, two senators, this was just before the midterms, uh, Tom Coburn and Barack Obama create, uh, proposed the creation of a searchable database of all federal government contracts and grants over $25,000. Now, if you could get that database, it would be great because then it would be a treasure trove for anti-corruption scandals, uh, and it would, for anti-corruption research. You'd, you'd be able to find out what they've, what they've funded, who they gave them to, and find out what happened. So political bloggers of all stripes Republicans and Democrats, they love the idea and they actually supported it in their blogs. Then this bill is going forward in Congress and suddenly it stops. It stops because one senator, an anonymous senator, puts a secret hold on it. A secret hold is an action you can take in Congress where um, it, it, it simply means the bill, is, the bill is tabled, there's no action on it, and nobody knows who did it. So the blogosphere went nuts. Um, and, but the people who really got pissed off were the Republicans and the Libertarians. And bloggers told their um, people to contact their senators. And in fact, every single senator in Congress, except the bill's authors, were called and told that they really think this bill is important and they want to go forward. Then bloggers pooled their efforts and they uh, flushed out the one senator who was the secret holder. And then, once that was established by the bloggers, then CNN and the Washington Post and other mainstream media picked the news up, and then it became news in the mainstream media. And then the bill was passed, and then the Office of Management and Budget on the same day in the afternoon. Now, the Office of Management and Budget is the organization that will now house the database. They had a meeting with the bloggers to ask for their continued support in the Office of Management and Budget's effort to monitor spending. So you have, uh, a, sit you have, you have a situation in which bloggers did act as a watchdog on power. They did act as independent researchers. They didn't act independently of these different sources, including mainstream media. I'd like to give a second example of media functioning as sources of knowledge for public, information for public knowledge and action, and as, a, as an actual communicative way that publics uh, can actually constitute themselves and behave. And the example I'd like to pick is Wikipedia. Now, counterintuitively, Wikipedia has shown that collaborative work can provide balanced and reliable information. Wikipedia is this extraordinary project. Can I find out how many people here I have ever uh, made a change in Wikipedia? Go you. Anybody have a watch list? All right. Um, Wikipedia is this extraordinary project. For those of you who have not yet become a Wiki Wikipedia maniac, um, to create an open source encyclopedia of information that people want to explain to other people. It's wide open to anybody. Uh, anybody can come in and change anything on a site. 
although to initiate a site you need to be a member. It's extremely extensive. It has more than three million articles. Actually, I wrote, when I wrote this, there was three million articles. It's been a few days. It's probably a lot more by now. In 125 languages, and it has three employees, including the founder. Everybody else is a volunteer, donating time, money, energy. Many of those people donate their time, money, and energy very briefly and very minorly. There's a much smaller group that donates their time passionately and intensely. They follow a few clear rules, including one that asks for a neutral point of view. This is, this is a uh, core value for Wikipedia. N neutral point of view, um, which I think I've, I've got the page up for, is um, not an objective, uh, it's not a call for objectivity, but as a, a fair representation of different perspectives. Uh, anybody who has a, different, has, has a perspective of any kind can contribute, but they must contribute in the spirit of making an entry overall that has a neutral point of view. Now, what happens in any Wikipedia entry is the communities form around issues and mini projects. These are often not communities alone, but publics. That, and I would define a, a public as a group of people who share a perceived problem they don't necessarily agree on the solution. They just agree that they have a problem and believe that communicating with each other will get them towards some kind of way of addressing the issue. On Wikipedia, good behavior is not universal. In fact, malicious acts are frequent. But because there are actual communities of action around committed to uh, creating these neutral point of view entries, there's a constant interchange among the participant, participants, and that means that repairs are also frequent. I'd like you to take a look at a visual representation of entries over time on a Wikipedia site. This is, this is uh, two ways of representing the site on abortion. Abortion, of course, is a very controversial topic. And this is a site that has been subject to many political attacks and it's also received input from many different competing views, and it has changed very dramatically over time. This visual representation was done uh, by a, a joint work by people from IBM and MIT, and they call it a uh, history flow. The different colors are different people's entries. Um, and this, this is, each color represents a contributor, and the size and the duration of the color line represents the amount of the contribution before the next change. Um, now, on the first slide, this is, a, uh, this is a, a slide that is, in which all the bars are new entries. So you can see that there are some points in this graph where there are black lines that run all, on the left that run all the way through the whole representation. That is where somebody did a malicious takedown. Somebody came and stripped out everything on the site. That's one kind of malicious act. So um, there, there are two big spots where that happens. On the right, that the, the chart is corrected to be a chronological timeline. On the left, it's like every, you see every entry is the same length of time. On the right, it's an actual um, time, uh, it factors in time. Those bars went away. They went away because when somebody went and did a takedown, somebody else came back immediately and replaced it. And they could replace it because Wikipedia uh, archives every single version of every site. So you can always just go back and save the version you liked. Now, how do people know immediately within seconds of somebody doing a takedown that that takedown has happened? They know because they're on a watch list. Because they, people who are absolutely fascinated by making sure that they understand what's going on with the abortion site uh, have decided to put, that, uh, to put that site on their watch list, which means that they will get an email whenever um, there's any change at all, and then they, they can go and see. 